holes and why we worry about the consistency of GR and, and quantum mechanics and why we think there might be a paradox. So um, it, it's, I've always found it quite puzzling that <clears throat> a lot of the techniques, if you're a practitioner in black hole thermodynamics, are <clears throat> very classical in nature um, and, and yet they're, they're revealing something you know, really quite, uh, quite deep. So, so I'm going to start off by just giving a very simple, the sort of classic argument that led people to believe uh, that black holes <coughs> might radiate. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so, I mean, there's all sorts of different ways that you can sort of pair up the T and phi parts of the Kerr metric to give you something that's uh, a sort of orthonormal basis. But here, this way is, is simply illustrating the existence of the horizon. So this is just a way of pairing it off where you see <clears throat> this would be your sort of time-like uh, one form and this would be your azimuthal one form for this orthonormal basis that in which the horizon is natural. Now here, the horizon go is when delta is zero, so there's all sorts of different ways that you could do that. Um, but if you look at radio, if you look at null geodesics, um, you'll see that in fact the ones, the boundary between those that escape and those that don't is indeed delta is zero. So, of course, we know there are two horizons. So, little m here is really just gm. It's, it's, a, it's a something with dimensions of length that is related to, sets the scale, at least, for the horizon radius. The area of the Kerr black hole depends on both r plus and a, so it's not just 4 pi r plus squared. And then the thinking was, or Bekenstein's thinking was, if we had black holes, you know, we talked a bit yesterday about the fact they didn't carry baryon number. Um, yeah? Oh, um, in this case, yes. No, sorry. This little m, I'm standing... Little m is gm. Okay. Yes. Or you can think of g equals 1 if it makes you more comfortable. <laughs> so I usually, actually, I try and avoid setting g equals 1 because, well, you'll see towards the end of today, but the reason I'm always a bit cautious about doing that in a blanket fashion is when you're flipping across different dimensions, the value of the Newton's constant acquires an extra piece 
that's dependent on the volume of the dimensions that you're kind of integrating over. And so I prefer to, to kind of keep G in the game because, you know, if you compactify with large extra dimensions, there's then a hierarchy between the G and the higher dimensional theory and RG. So, so in essence, for most, I think, I think um, probably for really what I'm talking about today with thermodynamics, except at the end, <laughs> you can forget about G. But um, it's just simply writing little m is obviously a lot faster. But yeah, good, good question, good point. Um, so, so there was this sort of conundrum that you could essentially use a black hole as a garbage tip and you could throw all sorts of stuff into it and then you would clean up your universe and lower the entropy. And so from um, the perspective of thermodynamics, this was very troubling indeed. And I still find it you know, quite impressive, if you like, that people who were still, you know, we're, only, we're talking about only a few years after the, the real uh, structure of the event horizon was understood and the analytic extension across the event horizon was, um, was actually worked out, that, that you're sort of starting to really think about how do these objects interact with normal everyday physics like thermodynamics. And so this was what led uh, Bekenstein to conjecture because it was known that the area of classically of a black hole only ever increased, conjectured that the area was related to the entropy because that was like a second law of thermodynamics. However, what wasn't known was what the constant of proportionality was. So what we'll do is we'll go through and just get to that point, but I'm not going to go through the argument of Stephen Hawking where he, which is absolutely probably the only legitimate argument to say to calculate the temperature of a black hole where you actually do do quantum field theory on the curved space background. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to use the method that we all use when we calculate T. Okay. So we throw in a particle. So we imagine we throw a particle in, it may or may not carry angular momentum, but it will carry mass. So because we, we didn't obviously give a full proof, but I've discussed the fact that these solutions are unique vacuum solutions, we know that once the black holes settle down and captured the particle, it'll still be one of these Kerr solutions. It's just going to have a different mass and different A, potentially. So... We look, therefore, at um, where are we? What we're going to do is think about how all of these different uh, parameters change. So obviously, delta A is just related to. Uh, the change in R plus um, and the change in little a. So that's as far as I'm, I'm very pragmatic. It's inside the event horizon, so it's never going to affect me. So I'm not, I don't mind. But it is an internal horizon, so it's an in, a, a second internal horizon inside the black hole. Um, so 
again, there's a thought about whether that, black, whether that horizon is actually stable or whether once you perturb the black hole, perturbations sort of crunch up on that inner horizon. Um, people do a sort of ADS-CFT type of argument with the inner and outer horizons. So, yes, it's important if you're sort of thinking more broadly about mathematics of, this, of the full solution. But from the perspective of today, I'm just really interested in the outer horizon, which is the boundary of things that we can see. Yeah. Where am I missing? So here, I'm just saying, well, how does the area change? So I, it changes if the little m parameter changes, changes if the little a parameter changes. So I've, I've really just plugged in what r plus is. And then we're going to use that um, a is j over m. And again, sort of whether g is there or not is not really important. And so that tells us delta a You can add the G's if, if you want. So all I'm doing really, I'm not doing anything mysterious here, I'm just just looking at how the change in A depends on the change in the angular momentum and the change in the mass. So from this, got something that looks sort of a bit like a first law. So here, if we think of du is tds, and then sort of a, a chemical potential and a change in a charge. So this here is actually the angular momentum of the horizon. So that's uh, sort of g t phi over g phi phi. Is it like a momentum or velocity? Oh, yeah, actually, that's a good point. Angular velocity. Quite right. That's even the word I've got on the piece of paper. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, angular velocity. So this sort of expression is kind of what led to this concept that maybe this is something to do with entropy and this is something to do with temperature. So again, there's been no mention of any field theory or anything. This is just from the perspective of the solution. Yeah. 
So in order to paint some flesh on that, um, without actually going into the full calculation, I'm going to use the usual cheat, if you like, that people do, which is to Euclideanize, to go to wick rotate to Euclidean time, and then to look at a sort of type of path integral approach to gravity, which again always has to be done with some delicacy because it's not really strictly well defined. Um, but there's so many things that fall into place so neatly that we kind of feel that it's, it's justified. So, sorry? Well, but it, it doesn't because it's not actually well defined. So it's, it's, it's really like, t I would liken it to tightrope walking. I think you have to be rather careful what you're doing with it. And um, so I think that it's also, <laughs> I mean, it's, it sort of does suggest that there's something deeper going on, but I don't think we know actually what that is yet. So... So if you want to read about this, this was first uh, put forward by Gibbons and Hawking. 77, I think. Um, and in that, they, they were, well, what, again, you know, I, th I think it's one of these really cool uh, pieces of, of work where they sort of notice something which I'm about to derive <laughs> Uh, briefly about the re properties of the Euclidean solutions, but then also in terms of thinking about uh, analytically continuing the gravitational action, this is where they noticed that the, re the true full gravitational action had to have a boundary term, which again, if you think about the normal arguments of the Lagrangian the methodology, when you, you do your variation of an action, normally you set your fields to zero on the boundary, and that's enough for your equations of motion. But the gravitational action is the Ricci scalar, which is a second derivative of the metric, and the metric is your observable. Therefore, your boundary terms are first derivatives of the metric, so you shouldn't really be setting them to zero. So you add a boundary term that kind of takes care of that. And so that is what also, I mean, it's two, two main sort of advances. One is more technical, which is the Gibbons-Hawking boundary term, but the, the conceptual one is about using the Euclidean approach. But also, I'm just going to refer you to, and I'm bound to misspell it, is it Jacob Sen or Son? Ted, Jake, is it Son. Jacob Son? I don't know why I keep wanting to put send. <laughs> so, but, but Ted has been thinking a lot about, about this sort of, this way of thinking about the, um, the, the, this particular path integral approach and the partition function. So he's got some quite nice, very recent papers on this. So I also recommend, if, you, if you're interested, to look at those. So... So here, if we just sort of think our, our h is really just an integral of a Hamiltonian density, which is really what is our 1 over beta times our uh, integral, really, of our Euclidean Lagrangian. So it's basically this, the partition function is just... effectively e to the minus uh, Euclidean action. So that's really the sort of thing that we're thinking about. It's not 
really well defined because if you think about fluctuations, we, we know saddle points are fine. They're just our normal classical solutions. It's, it's when we think about fluctuations that things go south. So um, again, that's why I said tightrope. So what we do conventionally in gravity is we focus on saddle points. Uh, that's a boundary condition that you would put in, but yes. So we don't. We really just, from from the perspective of doing these arguments with gravity, we really just think of it as the analytically, at least from the purposes of doing these sorts of calculations as the analytically continued uh, normal Lorentzian-Einstein action. Sorry, the, I didn't catch what you said. The Euclidean action is... Yeah, yeah, it's just, uh, but it's, it's... So well, because you might, this is, I'm putting the trace there because there might be more than one solution with the same um, boundary conditions. So, for example, um, if you're thinking about things with a particular periodicity at infinity, so, I mean, you could have, you could have flat space, I suppose, but if you think about the Schwarzschild solution, if you've just got pure Einstein gravity, there's just one solution with that periodicity, but if you start um, sort of adding fields, then you can get um, a whole sort of set of different solutions with the same periodicity, but have the sort of horizon dressed so that they've got a different M and they've got sort of different, different things going on. Um, so, so sometimes you do, you do have more than one contribution there, okay. yeah? Yeah, with the same boundary conditions. Mm. Again, for what I'm saying here, there's really just one, but it is possible. Um. Although typically those would be like instant on corrections because if you think about how, what, what they look like, you know, they're actually genuinely dependent on Euclidean time, so, you know. Okay, mm, saddle points this will be right. So if you analytically continue uh, your Lorentzian metric, you get a Euclidean metric that solves the Einstein equations. And for this metric, the Schwarzschild metric, R equals 2M is a sort of internal boundary. It's not really a boundary, but yeah, it's a sort of endpoint of the space or endpoint perhaps is a more accurate way of saying it. Um, Sorry, just another question. Um, so the Hamiltonian is the space integral over the Hamiltonian density, which is the same as the space time integral over the Lagrange? Yeah, that's a sort of one of my um, more hand-waving sort of arguments. But yes, it's, that's what it's just meant to sort of in, to indicate. Um, in reality, I'm not 
I'm not actually splitting my action up in that way. It's just meant to sort of be a, a, a slightly hand waving. Um, well, I mean, I guess I could have done that by doing a three plus one split and then uh, saying, OK, well, then I know what my Hamiltonian density is. I've sort of split off my time so I can make this particular split. But it's not, I mean, I think the, given that really all I want is that endpoint of relating things to the trace of the Euclidean action, it wasn't that important. It was more meant to just be a motivator. Hmm. So here, um, I just want to look, I sort of, we know that, that in the Lorentzian section, so this is straight out of the argument of Gibbons and Hawking that uh, R equals, sorry, I should be consistent, shouldn't I? Is that the Schwarz at the horizon of the black hole, the space time is regular. It's, it's something, you know, it's a causal boundary, but nonetheless it's regular. And so they argued that therefore the R equals 2m should be regular in the Euclidean section. I'm not, sh I'm not sure that totally stands up, but anyway, we'll stick with it. Um, so now, if we, we can sort of focus in, let's just forget about this bit, which kind of goes along for the ride. If I focus in here near r equals 2m, this is like dr squared over r minus 2m. So this is sort of... So again, this is just looking at it and, and a thought process. What are you looking for? This looks like d of r minus 2m squared, right? Sort of, right? So you use that observation to define a new row. And you know it's got to be proportional to the square root of r minus 2m, and then a little bit of small calculation shows you the constant of proportionality is 8m. Then this looks like So the dr squared portion of the metric just looks like d rho squared. And then And then if I turn my 1 minus 2m over r into a row squared piece, I see that I have the origin of polar coordinates if uh, tau over 4m lies between 0 and 2 pi. I got the right way around there, 8 pi m. So to make my horizon regular, I find that my Euclidean time is more naturally periodic and it has a given periodicity, 8 pi m.
So in other words, if I were looking for solutions with a given periodicity, I would be led to a given mass parameter. So this is the sort of classic uh, Euclidean argument to deduce the temperature of a black hole. And indeed, it's the argument that we, or the method that we tend to use to compute temperatures of a given black hole type solution. We simply wick rotate Euclidean time look at what happens near the horizon and determine this natural periodicity. So therefore, And then when you reinstate all of the constants that I've set to 1, you see that the temperature of a black hole, which is inversely proportional to its mass, is absolutely tiny unless you have a very tiny black hole, which would never form by direct gravitational collapse. So for Kerr, which was what I wrote over there, got to do a little bit more wriggling here, but anyway. So the crucial point about the calculation, I mean, this, this all agrees with, or at least the short shot one agrees with the computation of doing uh, field theory in the background of a collapsing star that ends up as a black hole and it gives this you know this precise constant of proportionality and so although this this argument up to here or the top of that middle board gives you this sort of broad argument that entropy is proportional to area it's the ca calculation of the temperature of the black hole that gives you that constant of proportionality. So I think probably, I don't know for sure, but what I'm guessing is that um, after calculating the temperature of the black hole, that uh, Stephen and Gary looked at this playing around, so they probably heard that finite temperature field theory was with the Euclidean time, looking to maybe do quantum gravity analytically continue, and then spotted that the Schwarzschild solution, the Euclidean one, was regular if you cook this particular periodicity, which precisely agreed with the full Lorentzian calculation. So that's why, in a sense, we sort of feel that all the pieces of the jigsaw fit together very well with black... <coughs> with black hole thermodynamics. So with those definitions, we get the standard first law So 1 over 4G, yeah. if you didn't have, that would be there, yeah. You, could, you can go through and put back G back in. So, oh, well, that's why I think I made some comment about, uh, about being a bit shifty there with Kerr. No, so you can still do the wick rotation with Kerr. Formally, you've got an I in front of the A. So some people, I think, like to also analytically continue A. Um, you can sort of hold your nerve and have a complex metric. Uh, it, it, 
it sort of all it sort of goes through. Um, but yeah, you're right. You know, you sort of end up with lots of r squared minus a squared. So when you and if when you're sort of coming back to your expressions, you have to sort of remember that actually you'd continue day, so you have to change my. But I mean, I, so I think that's a matter of taste. Some people analytically can sort of send a goes to i a, and some don't. But then you sort of keep a complex. I think generally, actually, it's sort of a highlight that the pro or at least one of the problems with analytic continuation is that. Uh, it's not really um, uniquely defined if you're only going to wick rotate time. So, I mean, the, the classic example is de Sitter or anti de Sitter, which have so much symmetry, you can choose a range of different time coordinates. Each wick rotation gives you a different analytic continuation. And so, you know, I think it's, um, it's probably one of these things that, in, in a sense, because you know the whole thing is working, you, you sort of, you allow the, um, the slight wobbles from time to time from a more, for, you know, but, but it works. <laughs> I think it's just, you, you know, there's, as you say, you have to just be, you have to observe that if I want to keep a real metric, I'm going to have to send A goes to I, A, and then remember I've done that. <laughs> Um, or you just hold your nerve with a complex metric. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I think it just, but it's, you actually get this the same with instantons. You know, when you're trying to do a tunneling process, at least in, with, with gravity, because normally you sort of imagine that your quantum bit, you know, the instanton bit is Euclidean time, and then you patch that onto a Lorentzian solution, but the only way that works is if you've got no uh, time derivatives on that initial data surface, which is sometimes true, but it's not, not necessarily true. So, so I think there's, it's an interesting question because I think there's quite a bit that's, uh, you know, perhaps could be done better. So, uh, yeah, I'm not actually going to talk about unruly temperature. Okay. So, I always thought it's more direct to it, and uh, maybe it's on the hand side, it's safer than the original derivation. Well, you say that, but actually, to me, it's even more fictitious in some ways, <laughs> you know, having a temperature for an accelerating observer, because, you know, at least here you've got an object that's giving you something, you know, distorting space time. So to me, uh, that, that sort of gives a sort of physical reason why, you know, that you've got a real curvature, you've got a real sort of shift in what you mean by your, your time-like coordinate, which is why you get a change in what your vacuum is, whereas an accelerate, I don't know, I mean, it, I know that it, I just personally find, find this more convincing. Yeah, hmm. me, more well, that's horses for courses. <laughs> um, okay, just one thing I just wanted to just write down because these So I just wanted to write this down because I may sort of refer to it later. Um, you can, and people often do, 
talk about thermodynamics very much directly relating uh, the quantities like T or S back to the original geometry and the, the sort of parameters in the metric. But in fact, it's possible to write it in a completely thermodynamic form. So this is a sort of a representative of that, where you're writing M in terms of these charges, the S and the J. So that's a bit more conventional. If you're actually doing thermodynamics, you would, you would be writing down a sort of relations between U and P and V. So this then allows you to write, for example, uh, T is dm by ds at constant j. So just things like that. So that's sort of a more, if you like, a more therm naturally thermodynamic or, or what's sometimes in the literature called a chemical way of expressing the thermodynamics of the black hole. So not too long after the, um, this sort of all these nice results uh, were, were proved about black hole thermodynamics, people started to think, well, what about the cosmological constant? You know, we know the cosmological constant affects the solution, the exact solution for a black hole. What happens if you imagine that varying? So I want to look a bit more generally of black hole thermodynamics. Now at the time, so this was a sort of, I guess, first started in the early 80s. But I think it's not really until more like about 15 years ago that this, that I think there was a better understanding of how things all fitted together. So remember, our f of r was 1 minus uh, 2m on r. And I'm going to write it as plus r squared on l squared. So this is ads and uh, lambda is minus 3 on l squared in four dimensions. And so l is the curvature scale of your anti de Sitter space. So again, we use the Euclidean trick for temperature. So we get that demanding that's regular gives us our rho squared is 4 over f plus prime into r minus r plus. And so we get a more general expression for T in terms of the derivative of this Newtonian potential as we approach the horizon. So here, if I ask what is that, that's four, 1 over 4 pi.
So often when people are doing this, they tend to sort of replace the mass parameter just so that everything's given in terms of the horizon radius, r plus, which is, of course, defined by f of r plus is zero. So if I just look at this, so this is, I think if you, let me just give you, this is the whole, So these black holes were looked at by Hawking and Page, and I think when they looked at them, there was this sort of notion, well, this is just a bit of fun, you know. Nobody really thinks anti de Sitter is particularly relevant or useful, but, you know, we can do it, so we're going to have some fun. So, <laughs> so if you look at T, notice when R plus goes to zero, T blows up. It looks like one over R plus. So that's very reminiscent of what happens with Schwarzschild, how the temperature is inversely proportional to the mass, which of course is essentially the Schwarzschild radius. So for very small R plus, it looks just like Schwarzschild. And we've got something like that. However, as R plus gets big, T diverges linearly. So that means we've got to have a turning point, and we have something like this. So that was what Hawking and Page noticed. And just and so as you increase R plus, that's really by increasing M. So one of the disturbing features about the temperature, the Hawking temperature, of a black hole is that it's inversely proportional to the mass. So intuitively, you think you've got this black hole, it's radiating, therefore it's losing energy, therefore its mass goes down, therefore it gets hotter, right? That's really counterintuitive, but that's the way it works. So black holes have a negative specific heat. But here, in anti de Sitter, if a black hole gets very big, it now changes to having positive specific heat. So that's sort of thermodynamically stable. So just to say that to get these. This minimum temperature is proportional to 1 on L. So that was um, sort of really interesting and an extremely um, new type of observation. Um, but of course, just saying a black hole has positive specific heat doesn't necessarily mean it's stable entirely. And so they went even further and tried to think about comparing black holes to a heat bath. Because if a black hole is radiating, is it more um, advantageous to have a black hole in, in equilibrium with a radiation bath? Or does it just want to disintegrate into a radiation bath? So the Hawking and Page looked at the Gibbs free energy.
So let's have a look at that. M minus TS is I think that means the cubed. So what they found is that if you have um, R plus is L, it crosses, it's equal to zero. For very large R plus, it's negative. Um, but then there's a sort of turning point. Remember, we've got a minimum T. So as R plus gets very small, this uh, free energy goes to zero, but that's at very, very high temperatures. Um, and so you get this sort of turnaround. R plus bigger than L, we've got the black hole preferred. And R plus less than L, we've got radiation is preferred. So this is known as the Hawking page phase transition. And it's obviously unique to uh, black holes in anti-de Sitter space. So I just want to investigate, just probe just a little further before a break. So if I add charge to my black hole, then my temperature becomes 1 over 4 pi r plus. Now gets a Q correction and dt by dr plus. So Now, before, we had a minimum T. Um, that's no longer true because notice this uh, minus sign here. So, in fact, as Q gets bigger, we see that the temperature drops to zero. So, if you've played with Rice and Nordstrom black holes in vacuum, this will be no surprise. And And this is the extremal limit, where the two, the inner and outer roots, if you were in Reissner and Nordstrom, the inner and outer roots of the um, f equals zero would coincide. So we get a similar extremal limit here, but it's just um, it's just a bit less. The root of f is is a more nasty polynomial to solve. Um, so I've now got two different behaviours. So if I have large Q, so here let's say this is Q squared is bigger than um, 
L squared over 36, then there's no root for t, so my t, just sketching it, does something like this. So increasing our plus would be adding m here. So here the temperature just goes up. And then if q squared is less than L squared over 36, you get a sort of wiggle in the temperature. So what this is saying is that um, if we have a small black hole, then locally, if you like, you're just the ADS. It's small, so its size is much less than the ADS curvature. So you're sort of saying, well, it's going to behave rather like the vacuum Reissman Nordstrom solution. So it has an extreme limit. You add mass, a temperature initially goes up, but then um, as you add mass, the temperature starts to fall because you're sort of entering like the standard Schwarzschild regime, and therefore uh, the temperature is more like inversely proportional to mass. However, as you then add more mass, you start to enter the ADS regime where your temperature starts to flip over and increase with mass. If Q starts off big, that tells you that the extremal limit is already a big black hole, which is comparable to the scale of the ADS curvature. And therefore, all it really sees is the ADS nature of the geometry, and T just carries on increasing. So these black holes are completely thermodynamically, at least, stable from the perspective of specific heat. So if I go back to those, uh, just these free energy plots, so I'll just give you that expression for M. So T starts off at zero, and because, in essence, if T is small, increasing T doesn't change G very much, so that this is relatively flat. Uh, but then you start to see the impact of this, this term, but you, you reach this, this kind of turnaround point here. You reach that first maximum, so T starts to decrease but your free energy is then increasing, then you kind of hit this minimum and you get this sort of shape. So as, um, as I increase Q, I'm just going to sketch your... That swallowtail goes away. So this gives you a sort of classic uh, swallowtail in your phase diagram. So I think that's a good point to just take a brief break and then I'm going to 
come back to that metric and derive the first law with varying lambda. How long break? Five minutes. Ish. And sort of think about a similar notion to what we did with Kerr. We're sort of imagining that the black hole absorbs something and settles down um, into a new final state with a new M, and maybe something goes on, and I can comment on that if anybody really wants me to, that changes the uh, ADS length scale. So we perturb the black hole. And what we know is that f plus delta f, so our and by f plus delta f, what I mean is f plus delta f has a, an m plus delta m and an l plus delta l, say. That's all I mean. And so, if I look at this, what this means is that uh, delta R plus, uh, F primed of R plus, plus delta M, dF by dM, evaluated at R plus, plus uh, delta L, And then the only thing that I would like to just change is I'm just going to, um, well, I'll come to that later. What I actually wanted to do, sorry, I'm going to write the full metric down. This was me trying to save, save writing. It didn't work. I'm going to also allow for one of those Ks. OK, so F doesn't depend on K, so what I've written there on the top is still true as long as I put equals 0, OK? And so here, the F by the M is just uh, minus 2 on R plus, and the F by the L is minus 2 r plus squared on l cubed. <coughs> so now, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to consider a broader class of solutions. Um, so here, let me just ask if I, if I say that the entropy is the area of the horizon over 4, then that's pi r plus squared on k. So if you are cutting out a wedge of space, that means there's less area. So my delta s
has now two pieces. So before, if we were going to do this argument to relate uh, delta R plus to delta S, uh, then we would have just had a direct uh, proportionality. But now I change R plus. Um, so I'm, that's not immediately the same as delta S of K changes. So we know F primed is related to T, but we no longer just have that first term being essentially TDS. So what else do we have? And I realize I've used different uh, Planck units here. So here, lambda is really minus 3 over 8 pi gl squared. So again, I'm going to sort of leave, just leave g equals 1 for this particular argument. And so lambda is actually minus a pressure term. So my ADS... Uh, vacuum has a sort of negative energy density but a positive pressure from the cosmologic the negative cosmological constant so that tells me that uh, minus 2 delta L over L cubed is 8 pi over 3 delta P So now I want to relate, I have a delta M coming in as well, but I want to identify what is the M in my first law. So if I think about what is the energy inside a black hole, And again, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to make the argument, which you, know, you can put um, detail on if you want. But if you th think about forming this black hole out of collapse of some matter, so if you imagine that you had a, a shell of dust at a radius r, then the overall mass of that shell would not be um, directly uh, 4 pi r squared times its surface energy density, it would have a factor of 1 over k in it. So these are just some thoughts, okay, about what we've, what we've got. But it would give the same cooperating ADM. Uh, so, wait a minute, because I'm just trying to remember that calculation. Because normally you've got, you look at behavior of the metric at infinity, mm -hmm. yeah? Which, that's still going to be that little m parameter. Mm -hmm. But then, if you want to integrate it round the whole sphere, then you get the 1 over k coming in, yeah. So, if I input these, these results, so first of all I get a delta M is So just coming from the, this expression here, my delta F, F plus delta F of R plus plus delta R plus is zero. This is what I get. But then I use this, this sort of line of reasoning to take this M onto the other side. I also identify the 
the volume inside or the notional volume inside the black hole So if you remember, I discussed the conical deficit and although I didn't directly derive it just for the sake of time, I also talked about those cosmic strings, those vortices. And when you do the back reaction calculation, you find that the deficit angle due to a vortex is 8 pi mu. So I can identify a tension or an energy per unit length for each of these vortices. And so that's where I get, I translate my delta K on K squared gives me a delta mu or a change in tension. And then the L's are like a length, a potential associated with those charges. And then, of course, the other thing that's very important to notice is this plus VDP. And this is how you take account of a changing vacuum energy. So I've used the phrase cosmological constant so far, but really vacuum energy would be a more accurate one to use, or vacuum pressure. So K, if K is 1, mu is 0. Yeah. So, <laughs> and as, yeah, so what this, so K goes to infinity is as you gradually sort of eat all of your deficit up, then you have a deficit of 2 pi, and that is, your, that is a sort of limit for a length, uh, a mass per unit length of one of these strings. So that's really when a string, if you went back and thought about these objects as being sourced by some energy momentum, that would be where that, that hit the Planck scale. And that's kind of the limit in, for, for sort of these static conical de defect solutions. So this notion of, um, we've got this V is known as the thermodynamic volume. P is very a real pressure for the, for the vacuum. But what this tells you, notice that this is not the normal first law of thermodynamics. So I think this was probably why when people were first looking at this, it kind of stalled a bit because um, allowing a vacuum energy to vary didn't kind of give necessarily what people were expecting. But then um,
But then as, as we sort of came back to this, and I think this is really the paper by Castor, Ray, and Trashen, where, where they said, well, no, actually, this is just fine, but M is not what you thought it was. It's not really the internal energy. And another thing to note is that if you throw a particle into a black hole um, and look at the energy momentum crossing the horizon, that does not increase M. It actually contributes exclusively to delta S. It contributes exclusively to work done on the black hole. So, there's also a nice review on extended thermodynamics by Kabiznik, Mann, and Tio. if you want to sort of look at a bit more, more of a review of the work. So I think, you know, what this has done is it's sort of said that, you know, black holes, it's not just your sort of standard charges. You can now look at them from a far broader thermodynamic perspective because the vacuum energy can vary. Now, for a while, I think the classic question you got when you mentioned this was, oh, how do you vary a cosmological constant? But, of course, we vary it all the time when we do cosmic, cosmic inflation because we have a vacuum energy of a scalar field, it slowly rolls, our vacuum energy is changing, therefore, of course, uh, P changes. And so, if we think about uh, a delta M, then we should, you know, it's perfectly natural to think about there being a delta P. And even in the context of ADS and string theory, uh, you get these uh, renormalization group flows where indeed P or L changes from the asymptotic regime down uh, to the interior, the infra sorry, the UV of the space-time. Ah, other way around, infrared. Always get them mixed up. So the, the new bit there, this bit with the cosmic string, so to speak, that was something that... Um, David and I, David Kabiznak and I looked at with a student of mine at the time, Mike Apples, um, and figured out how to include sort of these extra, uh, extra pieces of information about, about the black hole. So again, this is all just a very classical or, you know, it, it's, it's a very parametric type of argument but it's also backing up the notion of M as enthalpy because a string, generally, if it has positive energy per unit length, it has positive tension, which is negative pressure. So these minus d mu n, minus d mu's could be thought of as um, dp's in this case. So again, you've got the same sort of terms on the right-hand side. Sorry. When we do a transformation from uh, energy to enthalpy, then there is uh, variation of enthalpy uh, is uh, some T delta S plus P delta V, not V delta P. No, because... No, no, no. I'm so, sorry, sorry. No, this is du. Du is TDS minus PDV. So we add PV to both sides and then we get... VDP, yeah. Yeah, now that was why, um, you know, Castoray and Trashen sort of identified this as, uh, as the enthalpy. So, um, <laughs> so this was just a sort of straightforward conical defect through um, a black hole. So why... In essence, there's no real reason to do this because it's just sort of adding complications for the sake of it. However, the reason really for doing it was to think about thermodynamics of the C metric, which is an accelerating black hole, but by 
necessity, this is not an isolated black hole. It's not something where it's in vacuum around its horizon. It has to be being pulled in order to accelerate. And so what I didn't have time for yesterday, um, let's quickly get this C metric down in its simpler form. So just remember that F So what I didn't manage to say yesterday is that if we look at theta goes to zero or pi, then um, we have conical singularities. So So we have an imbalance. We have different conical singularities at the north and south poles. And you can't eliminate them both. So there's um, so that was really why we were looking at uh, the thermodynamics of black non-isolated black holes, uh, black holes that had these uh, conical deficits emerging from from their poles, and so just to uh, sort of. Normally, when you're looking at uh, this, these accelerating black holes, there's the possibility of an acceleration horizon. However, I'm going to look in ADS and focus on slow acceleration so that there's only a single horizon. So if you look at that form of F, you see that at large R, you've got a plus 1 on L squared, R squared on L squared, and you've got a minus a squared times r squared. So if um, a is sufficiently small relative to l, then you only have a single horizon for the black hole. So the picture here is that if you're an ADS, so just to sort of sketch it rather than deriving it, in ADS, this is the center of ADS, let me put it as a little dot. Uh, if you put an observer at a fixed distance away from the center of ADS, that observer is actually an accelerating observer even though it doesn't move. And that's due to the negative curvature of space-time. And it's just like here, where on the surface of the Earth, we don't move. 
but we're in an accelerating frame. So it's the exact same thing. So this is an example. It's a ringless space time, but it doesn't have a horizon. So our black hole, our slowly accelerating black hole, something like this. So this is our slowly accelerating black hole. So it's just meant to be a sort of sketch. It's our horizon. So it's not quite AL less than 1. Uh, it's, it's slightly more nuanced than that, but it's, broadly speaking, AL is less than 1. So we get, after quite a bit of work, <laughs> exactly the same form as before and you also can add charge um, and angular momentum although that complicates things an awful lot um, but here I think the key things to notice are that the mass now gets corrected by a term involving the acceleration, the entropy, similarly. So I think the, what this sort of shows is that although initially black holes, you know, your sort of standard thermodynamics was derived for a black hole that was like an, a sort of separate entity, isolated at least in the sense that the only thing that was near the horizon was perhaps some um, Maxwell field. In fact, you can derive these relations for a much broader range of black hole solutions. So whether these sort of are, are relevant physically, um, I'm not so sure, but uh, it certainly indicates that this, thermo this thermodynamic description is a lot more widely applicable. So you can also do, if you want to study the phase space, um, you can also find those uh, parametric expressions. And there's sort of quite an interesting phenomenon that occurs, and I'm just not quite sure how much to go into it. But um, if you look, for example, at those swallowtails,
But the swallowtails actually have this new phenomenon of a sort of snapping, by which I mean, if you remember, the swallowtail sort of had this type of structure. They kind of end at a particular point. And this is really just due to the fact, if I write the equivalent of the Christodoulou Ruffini formula, So because of the acceleration, you now get a sort of um, exothermic, a negative contribution overall to this enthalpy, really. Um, and that means that M can go to zero at some finite temperature. So this is sort of a snapping of the swallowtail. And so that's something that you don't see. Um, in sort of standard non-accelerating black holes. Um, so, so you mean the increasing increasing area? So in that sense, if you throw mass in, because the argument for a increasing really is more of a local argument around the horizon, that's still going to hold. Um, and so then. Then the question would be, what if a black hole um, captures a piece of string? Mm -hmm. um, and in that case, I guess in the end, you're using a thermodynamic argument to say that capturing the string would shoot out the, you know, the um, Schwarzschild radius. Yeah? But of course, actually seeing that, it's, you can't you can't do that um, same sort of nice local perturbative analysis because you've got sort of this quite complicated um, object getting oh, yeah, absorbed. Because usually yeah. you assume some sort uh, some version of uh, weak cosmic censorship uh, to prove the second law. So uh, violated by chemical singularities. No, I don't know. I mean, I, I well. It's a while since I looked at proof, but I thought it was just looking at the geodesic congruence and it's, uh, you know, the fact that the focusing, if you like, you know, would have to be uh, either zero, but if you had energy momentum crossing, then, then the geodesics diverged. Now, for the, for the vortex, it doesn't violate any of the sort of nice energy conditions. It's got positive energy, and it satisfies the dominant energy condition. So, um, so it's, not, it's not going to violate the usual. I mean, I thought you just needed weak energy condition, actually, for, uh, for the increase in area, which it definitely satisfies. I think what's probably where I would get a bit more nervous is the fact that because it's an extended object, you'd be sort of, you wouldn't, you know, you you're not really just looking locally, yeah? And yeah, so that would be what would make me nervous. Um, interesting question though. So, um, let me see. I did want to say something about ah, 10 minutes. Um, well, no, I was just, I was, I was going to say a few words about rotating black holes in ADS because there's something, it's, it's one of these uh, kind of interesting solutions that, um, you know, that when you, 
that sort of something strange happens with thermodynamics. So let me just pass it rather than going into it in detail because um, So first of all, just to note the solution, because actually some, some things happen that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So again, this, this would just be of interest if you were studying um, holography of rotation. Uh, but nonetheless, just notice a few things. You sort of see a lot of similarities with the C metric that was written down. You see that you've got this uh, capital Xi here, which now, interestingly, is not one if you want the poles to be regular. Uh, this is a sort of completely traditional Kerr. Uh, this is sort of not unexpected. And then the only other thing is that you also have this G function here, um, which is, again, perhaps slightly less expected. Now, what's interesting about this is this is a very natural set of coordinates to write Kerr in. It's like the equivalent of Boyer-Linquist. However, as R goes to infinity... <coughs> GT phi does not sort of, it goes like R squared. G phi phi you would expect to go like R squared. And so if I ask what the rotation is at infinity, I actually find it's not zero. So although these are very natural coordinates, in these coordinates, uh, the, the boundary is rotating. So you have to be careful when you're doing thermodynamics. So this is more... If it's not relevant for what your research is, you can just have a small, small break, but just have to be careful. The thermodynamic parameters So. 
So you start getting all sorts of corrections, corrections to the thermodynamic volume. And whereas before I was writing M was M on K for that accelerating black hole, there's sort of an extra factor of 1 over psi. So that's something to do, Malcolm Perry claims, with the normalization of killing vectors. I've never quite been able to pin that one down, but nonetheless, it works. So I just that was really just a lightning, very brief commentary on thermodynamics of Kerr in ADS, um, in case that's something of relevance. So what I wanted to finish off with is one of these um, sort of what I find, if you like, a curiosity of the thermodynamics. A lot of these thermodynamic expressions, it's been a very classical type of argument, just looking at solutions and how the solutions change under sort of little adding things to the black hole. Um, yet, it's meant to be a fundamentally quantum property of a black hole, because as soon as you really restore all the constants, uh, there's an h-bar coming into the temperature. So, in essence, maybe the, all of these properties of a black hole are, are just purely quantum mechanical. But the arguments that you get, the intuition from thermodynamics, then feeds back into results in classical relativity. So here, I just want to look at uh, simple black brains and an example of this. I'm probably going to finish it tomorrow. So here I'm just going to very quickly give some argument about why a black string or a black brain should be unstable. So here we have uh, the Schwarzschild solution, standard Schwarzschild, cross R. And so my four-dimensional radius of this cylinder is just 2 gm. And g, Newton, is equal to g5 divided by L. This is one of these examples where I just want to keep track of the g's. Um, and R4, which is 2gm, is 2g5m on L, therefore. So now I'm going to just look at what the mass of the cylinder is and compare it, the sort of entropy of the cylinder, to the entropy of the black hole of the same mass. So G Newton, which is just, I'm just actually writing as G, is G5 over L. Yeah. So Okay, so you can relate the entropy and to, I guess, the total mass, whereas a 5D black hole
has one over, sorry, I keep mixing my threes and twos, one over um, R5 squared over rho squared, so where R5 is the sort of five-dimensional radius, which is related to the mass using that formula from Myers and Perry. So D... So D is 5, so this would be A3, 3A3, there we go. So for that, that tells me that So you kind of see that the entropy has a different dependence on the overall mass of the solution. And so, you know, as, as the black hole gets bigger, you're going to kind of get a slightly different behavior between the black hole and the black string. So if we compare the entropies, What you find is that um, as L gets bigger relative to the mass, eventually the entropy of the black hole wins out over the entropy of the black string. So this argument indicates that long or skinny black strings are unstable. And so that's just a very heuristic argument comparing entropies of solutions. But then you can go back and look at the linearized perturbation theory for the black string solution and actually look for the instability. So I'm going to stop because I don't want to sort of push all the lectures any later. But I'll pick up that thought tomorrow morning. <laughs>